there's a book that I read last year, the year before, called Die With Zero. And there's a point where you reach a certain level of net worth that you can sustain yourself for the rest of your life. Even if you dip down a little bit, as long as you're being generous with yourself and your family and doing the things you want to do while I'm in my active years, why is that a bad thing? What's the point of saving all of my wealth until I'm in my 80s and 90s? Welcome to the Idea and Investor Show. Today, we want to talk about real estate investing again, and we have a special guest, and you guys will probably really enjoy this. Michael Dominguez is with us today, and he is the armchair real estate millionaire, and you can actually go to his website for that. But I want to first say thank you, Michael, for joining us on the show. How are you today? I'm wonderful, and I'm really looking forward to having a chat. We've already had a good chat, so now it's a, an official chat. So tell us a little bit, you know, I mean, you told me that you're in Toronto right now, that you have great ambitions going forward. Tell us a little bit how you got into the armchair millionaire situation and what it's all about. Absolutely. I became a real estate agent in 2008, which was, as it turned out, a bit of a trying time to start in real estate. The American market was really hit. Canadian market, not so bad, but I became a realtor at that time. And I realized the advantages of becoming an investor. I gravitated towards the investors right away. And within a year or two, I started to realize the benefits of buying investment properties. And I started, like everyone else, I bought the undervalued properties in tertiary markets and tried to renovate them and had a few challenges and crappy tenants along the way. But I quickly started to realize the benefits of investing in quality properties, in quality neighborhoods, and then attracting really great quality tenants. And then doing a lot less work on an ongoing basis and then making profits. So I particularly invest in just outside of Toronto, Ontario. And for those that aren't familiar with our market, we are probably the fastest appreciating market in North America. We're one of the fastest growing cities in North America. There's speculation that in, in my market in the next 25 years, we'll see another 40% population growth. And when we're dealing with growth like that, we're just seeing massive price increasing and rent increasing. And so that's my story. And so now I'm semi-retired as a realtor. I sold my business and my goal is to spend as much time as I can in Southern California. Yeah, that's very good. And I mean, if you come down here, we definitely have to meet us. You know, I'm in the San Diego area. It's not very far from Huntington Beach and any place in Southern California. So that would be really cool. Now, you have this term armchair in your philosophy. Can you go a little bit deeper and maybe talk to the audience about what do you really mean by that? And how does yeah. that apply? Yeah, armchair doesn't necessarily mean absentee. It becomes a much more passive investment. But again, not absentee. If you are still running a business, however, real estate investing should fund your life and not run your life. And so I've designed a system, not for the person to buy their 60th or 800th property, but to get going and buying their first, second, and third investment properties, because there's so many North Americans that are in a position where if they can make a few smart financial decisions, it can change the fortunes of their life, it can give them the opportunity to put their children through school, retire earlier, just give them more choices. And then, but buying the quality properties and quality neighborhoods is it may take as little as two or three hours a month to manage your business, but it can change the fortunes of your life. Yeah, that's very good. Thank you. I can second that. I mean, we are obviously, in a sense, pretty aligned, even though I'm not using the term armchair. I find that most of the people who come to us for like our mentoring program very quickly associate and get excited and motivated with this whole frame of what we call the time freedom point basically a point in the future where a certain number of properties generate enough cash flow to cover whatever you have for yourself decided are the expenses that you want to have covered so that you can then, what I always call, live your passion and do the things that you really want or very little if you <laughs> want to do very Absolutely. little. Absolutely. Right. You know, Robert Kiyosaki with his Rich Dad Poor Dad speaks about that as well, where it's you get into the cash flow zone and all of a sudden, you know, you could live your best life because your income is being replaced by your investments. That's the dream, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And one thing, I mean, you mentioned that you sold your business successfully and you're basically in a semi-retired state. 
Can you tell a little bit, because there aren't that many people, I have to admit myself, I'm close, but not quite there. And most of the people that we're working with aren't quite there yet. So you are maybe in this unique group of people who is basically there. What it actually means in maybe, you know, if you describe how a week or like a certain period of time in Michael's life looks like from the perspective <laughs> of what I can do now that I really enjoy that I wouldn't otherwise be able to do or haven't ever been able to do? I'm still feeling it out. I'm going to be honest with you because so much of us, I'm 56 right now. And for 54, 55 years of my life, my focus has always been to build my net wealth. It's always been to move forward and take another step and work forward to actually get the point where you can actually hit the brakes on wealth building on an active basis and focus more on what you want to do, what your passions are, that's a bit of a challenge. This year, obviously with the lockdowns, we've had some challenges in terms of traveling. But by in the last 12 months, I took a trip. I drove my Corvette convertible along Route 66 from Chicago to Santa Monica and had a wonderful trip through the United States. It's one of my passions is just experiencing life and driving road trips. And that was a great experience. I'm a huge baseball fan, and I see baseball stadiums from all over North America and the world, for that matter. But it's also allowed me the opportunity to learn. And it may surprise a lot of the listeners that I actually spent more money on coaching and education in the last 12 months than I've ever spent before. And so I took courses to teach me how to become a better value investor for my equities. I'm now doing option trading as a hobby, and I'm doing well there. And the other thing I'm doing from an investment standpoint is I'm finding various ways to achieve multiple streams of income. So I'm doing private mortgages. Obviously, I'm getting cash flow from my real estate portfolio. I'm getting residuals from the sale of my business. I'm obviously getting dividends from some of my equity investments as well. And I'm making a dollar or two from my book sales. But you're not releasing a book to make any money, let me tell you that. I totally second that. I've written one and have co uh, co-authored with some other people. And then it was more and always is to get the message out and maybe help yeah. somebody, not necessarily. Pay it forward. Pay it forward. it forward. Now, the thing that I th think is fascinating, you mentioned that people might be surprised about, you know, the educational component, the learning and so forth. What many of our clients ask me oftentimes, and I think you're the perfect person to answer that, is when I reach that time freedom point or freedom of time and passion that you described, Michael, will I then finally have the opportunity to dig a little deeper? Because so many people, and I would add myself to that, we're constantly wanting to do stuff and learn a little more and go a little deeper but then there's the next meeting on the calendar or there's the next thing to do or the next email to answer or the next phone call to do and so it feels like yeah we're addressing stuff but never really with a whole lot of depth so can you say if that has changed for you in some way the, the last few weeks i'm going to say no because <laughs> i'm doing my trip to california and i'm trying to wrap everything up and I'm doing a series of interviews and various meetings. But over time, absolutely, it has changed my life. Where back in the day, like I'm a, a list maker, as many people probably listening today are. And I honestly can't go to bed at night until I've made my list of the tasks that I want to do for the next day. And when I was an active day-to-day -day realtor and focusing on so many other projects at the same time, I had a small team in my business as well. I might have had 15, 20 things on my to-do list that I had to tackle. Now my list is sometimes as little as three to five items. And sometimes it almost freaks me out because I'll be 11 o'clock in the morning and then I say, I've crossed off everything on my list. I think, what now? <laughs> and so it's, I'm not going to lie to you. It's been a bit of a work in progress. One thing that's always been a passion of mine as well, just again, I'm doing different things. I have been volunteering at a couple of organizations. There's a junior achievement program that I've been involved in, and I've been helping out a number of younger investors, paying it forward and helping them out. Not a full coaching program, but just guiding them along the path. But the other thing, which is, it's just one of these things is I've always enjoyed watching classic movies. And how many times all of these great movies, you sort of see and you say, oh, Casablanca, I got to watch that someday. And well, when is someday going to happen? This year was my someday. 
And so I went down the list and the American Film Institute had the list of the top 100 movies to, of the 20th century. And I watched them all. And again, is that something I'm going to do forever? No. But again, I'm doing what I want to do rather than what I have to do. Right. And I really want to appreciate you for sharing that because so many people have a little bit of a fuzzy image in their mind of how would that really look like when I reach my time freedom point. So it's wonderful to have someone who we can ask. Now, one thing I would like to kind of go back to at the beginning, you were talking about your experience and what it means to be armchair millionaire and stuff like that. And you focused, I think, importantly for our audience on the quality of the asset that the investor gets into. And I think a lot of people got a little bit misguided by watching, and I don't know if Canada has that, but we have like a TV channel called HGTV. HGTV, I make it all the time. <laughs> right, yes. yeah, and you know, like they find the ugliest little thing and then they renovate it and over renovate it further than they initially ever wanted. And then they thought they get 500 for it, but then out of some miraculous reason, they sell it for 650 and made 150,000. Everybody suddenly wants to become a flipper or like a real estate investor. And for me and for our mentoring clients, we have lately shifted more and more to look not just at the performance. Anybody who knows me knows that I'm always preaching on it's not how much it costs. It's not automatically how much rent you can get. It's really the relationship and the performance of the asset. But what we're shifting more and more towards is basically the concept of build to rent or an inherently high quality asset. Can you talk a little bit about what your experience is and how much that plays a role in ultimately being able to lean back in the armchair, not just being in an armchair typing away in emails and stuff. Well, first of all, when it comes to HGTV, we're the home of the Property Brothers and Scott McGilvery, who had the TV show Income Property that was very popular in the United States as well. So for someone who knows people that have been, had regular appearances there because I'm in that circle, it may surprise some of you to know how much fiction there is on these shows. The costs are in many cases under marketed. The costs are way more than they said they were and what they're selling them for. In some cases, they'd already purchased the property. They'd had the property for six months to a year. And then they went through the show to try to teach people which property they should buy. Meanwhile, they'd already owned that one for six <laughs> months. So complete fiction. Don't trust any of the stats. It's amazing how in a 30-minute show, they can get this renovation completed. So. I'm a person that tells people that people have made money on flipping. I'm not going to lie to you on that, but it is a full-time job and there is risk associated with that. It is certainly by no means armchair or passive. The people that have been most successful as flippers have, have made it their full-time gig. What I talk about is I'm looking for something that's going to take me and my clients a couple hours a month. And it's the part-time job that will make you a millionaire. I don't want to drive for Uber Eats. I don't want to make scrunchies on the side. I want to invest in something that's going to make a significant difference in my life. And being a residential housing provider in a market where there's huge demand, where if you Google Austin, Texas housing crisis, you'll get a litany of issues. And so flip it on the other side is, well, if everyone's complaining there isn't enough, maybe I should have some of those things. And where I focus on is I love the ADUs, the additional dwelling units. I could rent out a single family home for, let's say, $2,500 a month in a certain market. I can rent it out the upper level. In my market, I have basements. The upper level for perhaps $2,000. I could renovate the basement, get another fifteen dollars to eighteen dollars to $2,000 for that. So now I'm generating, in many cases, 50% more rental income in the same footprint. In the case of California or Texas, they don't have basements. But in many cases, you can put something in the back or a trailer or a loft coach house above a garage, replace a garage. These are all options that are available. But once you create that asset, now it gets to the point where it essentially runs itself. You can attract the best quality tenants because you've got a great location and people are going to want to go there. Yeah, that's really awesome. And that's a great alternative or at least addition, I would say, to the traditional way to say, let me find a property that performs well. Now, can you talk a little bit since you obviously have been doing this and people might be wondering, especially like a lot of the clients that come to us live in relatively expensive areas where they 
normally think it will be very hard to get a performing asset. And it's twofold. It's two issues to address. And I don't know if you have some wisdom to share for both of them. The one, and I think I sympathize the most with, and that's why I have pretty much myself invested mostly out of state, is that the initial investment you have to make, like just for your 20% down payment, yeah. is typically in the order of what the whole house cash pay costs in other locations, right? So that's the one thing. The other part that I find interesting, probably for the audience, for anybody who says, well, I, maybe I could do this where I live as an additional source of income, even if you occupy the residence yourself and you have the space, is how is that actually seen or treated by the lenders? Are they expecting you to come out of pocket for that? Or is there any way to get financing for that? Because it's kind of the same issue, right? Do you have the ability to make the down payment on the main property? And then how would you be treated if you say, okay, I want to do an ADU and it costs, I don't know, eighty, ninety thousand dollars or so? Lots of great questions there. And there's one of the things we've seen in the last 24 months with the surge in challenges because of the pandemic has been an increase in pricing in our residential homes, especially in quality markets, have grown unlike really ever before in, in many markets. I shared with you beforehand that we've been seeing over the last 24 months, we've seen over a 50% rise in property values in my market that I focus right. on. And we've seen that also in Southern California and Texas and other markets like that. I'm not saying that investing in tertiary markets where the prices are 100000 for a home is a bad idea. But for me, I would much rather invest in the outskirts of a San Diego, for example, where I know my market. It's got a great walk score. It's close to everything. I can buy that property. And assuming that I've followed my market fundamentals and if in my residential community, the municipality is allowing us the ability of adding additional dwelling in it. Don't go out and buy a property and then hope to change it. You have to know going in, be an expert, be a sophisticated investor. And if you know that it's very doable, then absolutely, you're factoring in, you get 20% down on the purchase and then adding the extra suite. In the case of if you're already living in that property, there's a term that's become very in vogue right now. It's called house hacking. And so whether you already own the home or you're a young person, you're looking to buy your first property, buying a residential home in the area that you want to live, and then adding a secondary suite income is a great way for you to get into the real estate market and to actually have the tenants paying the vast majority of your mortgage. In many cases, you can afford a much better home. Now, this may not be your dream home. Your spouse may not love the fact that you've got a tenant that's in the unit right next door. But if you can get one or two or three investment properties in markets like that, then and just simply be able to hold these investments with a little bit of cash flow, yeah, we're not counting on appreciation, but if it meets the right market fundamentals and it has GDP growth, population growth, and all the things that I talk about in my book, you're going to be very happy with the long-term results if you could hold on to that property for 10 or 20 years. It'll change your life. Yeah, absolutely. And I really appreciate you sharing this, Michael. I used to call this kind of, in a sense, a waterfall approach for somebody who doesn't want to go out of state. Right. But if you really think about it, if, I mean, the younger, the better, but even if you say, okay, I'm maybe not the youngest, but at least I have a solid job. Let's say you go for your first own house, you get all kinds of preferential treatment from the financing to get into that. Oh, sorry. I didn't talk about that. Yes, you're right. Yes, my bad. <laughs> yeah, so, no, I'm, I'm just pointing it out because when you and I want to do an investment property and don't have to pay mortgage insurance and stuff, you have to put at least 20% down. But if you're a first-time home buyer and you're going to occupy this property that may have a huge backyard or something like that, then you can get away with three or four or five percent down, which is for most people much more reasonable, especially in a more pricey area, like you mentioned here, San Diego or other pricier areas. And interestingly enough, what a lot of people don't realize is the government only really requires you to be in that place for two years. Right. So you can, after two years, say, OK, now I'm not a first time home buyer anymore, but I still can now find this next property that you just described, Michael, and get in there because it's my own residence, as long as I have a good credit score and a solid income, 
and I can get in there for like 5% down or maybe 8%, 10% down, which is still relatively easy. And if your property in those two years, I mean, if it's Toronto, you increase your value by probably 60% at least. So now you can get a home equity line of credit and take that for your down payment on the next property. So you can kind of like cascade or waterfall yourself from property to property as long. And this is, I think, for me, one of the important messages. And I wonder if you would agree with that. I talk about the time freedom point. I talk about these cascades and waterfalls and different ways on how you can actually build a value asset portfolio. But you have to accept that under normal circumstances, Yes, when you start younger, it might be a little easier, but fundamentally under normal circumstances, you have to accept that it's an eight to 10 year journey. On the other hand, if I say, okay, how about it? You are 32. How would life be if you never really have to worry about income anymore at 42? Or ask your parents, ask your friends, anybody, would they love to have a life like you have now, Michael, but already 10 or 15 years earlier if they had the chance to start earlier, right? So for many people, I believe we are suffering a little bit from this instant gratification, everything has to happen tomorrow. And when somebody says, well, if you start the journey that Michael is now completing or has completed, and you know it's going to be eight to 10 years of somewhat be disciplined, follow an approach and stick to it, don't jump around to a million different opportunities, then you can already pretty much predict plus or minus a year or two when you basically be in your situation, Michael, where you get your Corvette and drive Highway 66 and you're <laughs> going to help some young people to avoid the mistakes that they were prone to make and stuff like that. So this time horizon, is there a little bit that you can share what your perspective is? Honestly, you said it probably, Axel, better than I'll ever say it. But <laughs> let, let me share with you that in my book, I quote Bill Gates's quote, where people tend to overestimate what they can accomplish in one year and underestimate what they can accomplish in 10. And I was a huge believer in that philosophy. My goal, which was perhaps a little different than others, it's not like I had gazillions of dollars. I had a house that was worth maybe $600,000 12, 13 years ago, and it was paid off in full. So, And that was really our primary asset that we had. We had a little bit in retirement savings, but not a ton. And we were able to get a line of credit against our principal residence. And much like your definition of cascading effect, we were able to take the line of credit. And in our country, we're able to purchase a property with 20% down and the 20% we could use from the line of credit from our principal residence. And for those of you that are poor at math, I was able to get 80% financing from the bank and the other 20% from the bank from my principal residence. And for those that want to know the number that adds up to 100% financing. So I was basically borrowing the bank's money to allow me to purchase further assets. And then as I improved those assets, I was able to, as you said, refinance them. And my goal was, and I accomplished that goal, was to purchase one property a year for 10 consecutive years. You hear stories, and I'm sure you've interviewed people, Axel, that have 50 or 100 or 5 billion properties, and we all applaud their success. Because, you know, it's it's impressive, but it's really not relatable for most of us. And as little as one, two, or three properties can allow you to retire earlier, pay for your children's education. And if you get to the point where you can get six or eight or 10 properties in appreciating markets, you'll get not only the cash flow, which will help you and your family out short term, but you'll get the long term appreciation. Because if, let's say, you are living in the outskirts of Los Angeles or the San Diego or the Austin area, and you're in a great market, why not have three or four of them? Maybe your own principal residence has doubled in value in the last 15 years. Wouldn't it have been nice if you had three of those properties? And that's the kind of investing strategy that I've tried to employ. And to your point, again, it's not a get rich quick scheme, but it's a get rich for sure scheme. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for describing that. One thing for um, people who are looking out for our newsletter and stuff like that, I had multiple people amongst other places, bigger pockets being almost famous for that, saying, you know, like everybody is talking about making $10,000 in passive income, but you need, like you just said, Michael, right? Like you need 50, 60, 100 properties. Who is ever going to make that? And I felt challenged by that. And I don't know, I may be weird for the audience. Now, you know, I'm kind of weird. But I went in and said, okay, so what (laughs) is... I could tell, I could tell. Uh, Right, right. So uh, we're German. It's just... But I wanted to say, okay, what is an example that somebody can relate to? 
So here's what I did. I said, okay, take Michael's example and give yourself the goal to buy a property every year, but maybe very modestly assume you can make $300 of cash flow and you find a way to increase the rent year over year by $50. If you take those one property a year, you're starting with $300 positive cash flow and you increase the rent $50 a year. Somehow $50 is always the number, <laughs> no other yeah. variables, right? No inflation, no equity, blah, blah, blah. Well, the end result is you do this for 16 years, you will end up with 15 properties, obviously, and you're making $10,500 monthly income just yeah. out of that positive cash flow. Now, the reality is it would be way more than that. But for anybody saying it needs to be 50 or 80 or 100 doors and all that kind of stuff, I think it's pretty interesting to have a little table. I made a picture out of it and everything just because I feel that makes it much more achievable. And most people I would challenge and say, really, 10,000 a month? Is that really what you need? I don't know if you need that, Michael, but... If you say, okay, well, when could I be done if I wanted to have like, let's say five or 6,000 a month, you would be done in 10 years or less. And that's still with debt financing. Every property yeah. would still have the mortgage on yeah. it and, and all that. Now it gets better after the point of where you say, okay, I got enough now. I get on my Corvette and drive 66, right? After that, the tenants will keep paying the rent and Forever. paying the mortgage. And sooner or later, it's going to actually, as we both know, kind of jump almost on an exponential curve because when the mortgages fall off and you don't add anything more then you make the full income in cash flow basically except for a little bit of cost but that i just feel it's for somebody to say okay if i want five or six thousand i need 10 years if i really want a ten thousand i need at the most 15 years in a reasonable way without having properties that skyrocket through the roof or make me hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cash flow and rent increases like crazy. None of that is necessary. And I can share with you as well, like this last couple of weeks have been a bit of an exception. We've had a major winter storm here and we've been spending more time with our properties than we normally do. But in general, we spend about five to eight hours a month on our entire portfolio. But if even that's too much work for you and you feel that having 10 or 12 properties is more than you want to take on, there are so many benefits to owning these properties for a decade or more, because especially if they're in appreciating markets, what I know of a couple people that have done is they've sold off as much as half of their portfolio in their later years and then taken the cash and either reinvested it in other ventures or potentially could even pay off the mortgages of the properties they decided to keep. And so using your same statistics, as little as five or six properties, which honestly doesn't take a lot of your day if they're great properties in great locations, could give you the cash flow you need to live your best life. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great point. Thank you for sharing that, Michael, because if you think about it, those properties, when you started, when they make 300 cash flow with the financing on it, would probably easily make a thousand if you didn't have the financing. Or more. Or or more. more. So that means, you know, you triple basically your income. And so even if you were to go down half the number of properties, you would still have more than keeping yeah. them all with a mortgage on, at least initially. So there's a lot of different ways. And I think it's just important to say, on the one hand, it's like you said, not an overnight success, but the time frame in the normal expectation of what is my work life is somewhere in the area of a third to a quarter of what normal people's work life would be. And if we're willing to say, okay, we can show you a way, you have already done it, I'm trying to show people a way on how in a quarter of the time you can get to a same or better life than people who are laboring along all their life for 45 years. I think that should be motivating for people to say, I want to find out more. I want to talk to Michael. I read his book. I Maybe even crazy idea, call me and talk to me about it. Right? So. And they should. They really should. <laughs> I'm going to ignore you. No, just yeah. it's And for me, my number was a little higher than what you said. My goal was to get the $15,000 a month in residual income. And so... That was my goal. I wanted to achieve that goal. And when I passed it, it was weird. It was like, I don't know this because I've never run a marathon, but for someone who's run a marathon and then you've completed the marathon, I'm sure there's people that say, okay, what's next? And to reach that point is kind of a surreal feeling, I can tell you. And so I'm still feeling my way through it. And the writing of this book was part of that as a way of paying it forward. I had some incredible mentors in my life, some people that had no need 
to help me up. When I was 42, 43 years old, I had sort of a defeatist. Well, I was starting to get more positive by then. But when I was in my late 30s, I always felt that the wealthy people would push me down the success ladder. And they were in a position where they had all the money and I had none of it. They wouldn't help me up. But to my surprise, the real estate investors community is such a great community. And the number of people that reached down and pulled me up a rung or two in the ladder and to the point where now I'm at the level that they were at back then. And I always promised myself if I reached that point in my life, I would help others as well. And that's really what Armchair Real Estate Millionaire is all about. Yeah, that's really cool. And I'm sure there are lots of people who will thank you for that already or in the future. Um, I mean, one of the things that comes to my mind is there are these phases, right? And there's lots of books out there when they talk about, you know, about a business or an idea that you need to kind of establish in the marketplace. I'm also finding this with real estate investing, where the first phase oftentimes is, I heard about it, but I don't think it's for me or I could ever do it. Then maybe they come to me or you and we basically put them under our wings and show them how to get your first property and what to consider and how to try to avoid as many of the mistakes other people who are uninformed make. And maybe then the second. At the third or latest at the fourth, you become basically, at least I see it that way, almost like a person who is trying to avoid the addiction and addictive behavior. <laughs> Right, where people say, now that I get more comfortable, now that I see that I can do it. And I actually had one of our clients who I said, hey, how about, you know, we drive somewhere and we meet. This was uh, in 2019 before COVID and stuff like that. And he literally said, oh, sorry, that is not a location I can get to. I sold my car. I said, what the heck? Why did you sell your car? Oh, do you know how much that cost me? If I have my car sold and stuff and no insurance, no gas and stuff, I can save the money and then I get to my next properties. And I only realized that at that point, I said, oh, you're on this addictive frugality trip now where you can't wait to have enough money to buy the next one. It's kind of funny, right? Like I can't do it. Now I have an idea how to do it. Now I'm so addicted, I can't get to it, the next one fast enough. So it's kind of kind of weird yeah. in a way. <laughs> oh, it, it is. Real estate investing can, or wealth building, can be an addictive situation. And I know a lot of people in my circle now that they've long since passed their magic number, but they're continuing to grow and working 60, 80 hour weeks and traveling all over North America, trying to find that next deal. And for me, I... When I turned 50, I had aspirations of hitting 100 million or 500 million net worth. I thought, you know what, if I really work hard the rest of my life, I could become worth nine figures. And, and then it was around age 51, 52, where I had a few of my uh, three clients actually pass away in a short period of time. And they were in my circle. And I had a chance to speak to a couple of them before they died because they had cancer. And it was one of those situations that I actually shared that in my book. It helped to change my perspective on things. And I started to think a little differently. And I thought, is this all there is? Is this what I'm doing it for? And so I decided I would reach a certain point in success and then stop. There's a book that I read last year, the year before called Die With Zero. And there's a point where you reach a certain level of net worth that you can sustain yourself for the rest of your life. Maybe if you dip down a little bit, as long as you're being generous with yourself and your family and doing the things you want to do, while I'm in my active years, why is that a bad thing? What's the point of saving all of my wealth until I'm in my 80s and 90s? My folks are in their mid 80s now and they live in a retirement home and their big excursion for the day is to go to a drugstore and buy a bottle of orange juice or something like that. Now is my time to enjoy my wealth and to enjoy my life and I'm taking advantage of it as best I can. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's really an important message to share. One thing for those of you who will hear this as audio only on Spotify or so forth, I would really like to encourage you to spend a few minutes when this comes out also as a YouTube video, because you should look at Michael's face and see he is smiling constantly. And this is how a happy person kind of looks like, at least in my book. And I can encourage him sitting back. Sit back in his chair and smiling. And that is, you know, something we always, I think, should take a moment to say, you know, Am I just doing it for the numbers or am I also doing it for the emotional state that I'm going to get into? And I think you have a brilliant example for how that can look like in reality on video so everybody can go and take a look at it. So with that being said, we're coming to the end of the show. I always ask two questions to our guests. So the first one would be, if you had a choice to 
meet a person that maybe somebody that is not that easy to meet, who would it be and why would you want to meet them? Yeah, I, I have listened to your show before, so I've been giving this some thought. <laughs> and I, unfortunately, I'm going to have a small dinner party because I want to have Robert Kiyosaki. Some of his guidance really affected my life, and I'd love to sit down and chat with him. Warren Buffett, who, again, I've actually been to the Berkshire Hathaway events, and I've listened to so many of his teachings. And Mr. Wonderful, Kevin O'Leary, oh, um, okay. who's, who's also a Canadian, by the way. And so I would be the fourth and I would honestly, they would probably do 99% of the talking and I would just be writing down notes and just learning as best I can and getting a vision from their wisdom. Yeah, I think that would be a really cool event to see. I mean, I actually, it tells you, you know, like what kind of person I am. When I ran out of shark tanks, I went to the dragon stand, right? So, <laughs> so, so for people who want to check out what that means. But yeah, I mean, yeah. Larry can definitely get you all the right meals and wine and utensils and stuff. And Robert Kiyosaki can bring a really cool car from what I <laughs> <laughs> so. And you know what? And now I don't know how I would dress, but honestly, it would be a highlight of my life if I got to, to get their wisdoms and such like that. So. Yeah, you know what the point about that is? This is actually something that I oftentimes tell my, my mentoring and coaching clients is if you really look at these people, unless they have some shtick or they are in a show where they have to show that shtick, in most cases, they just be themselves and dress themselves with what they're comfortable with. And I don't think any one of those three would really care that much how appropriate <laughs> or awesome that is. Now, the other question that I always ask is if you had a time machine, yeah. you go forward or backward, where would you go and why? And again, I gave this one some thought as well. And although Seeing the past would be fascinating. I would love to know what happened in the past and reflect on that. But I'm more of a going the future kind of guy. And I'm going to give you a real quick example is I've always wondered what Walt Disney would think today if he was able to see the vision that Disney has become over the last 50, 60 years since he's died. And in a much, much smaller scale, I'd love to see in 30 years or 50 years after I died, or even just 20 years in the future when I'm still alive. I've been fortunate to be able to touch a lot of people, not only in my own family, but in my circle. And we've seen the benefits in a 10 to 20 year scale, but how does that affect it at a 40 year scale? And it, it's so amazing. I've been already seeing this firsthand where the people I've touched have now touched others. It's been an amplifying effect. And so I would really like to see how the future holds based on some of the work that we've done now and just to reflect back and hopefully hopefully pat myself on the back a little bit, and just be proud of what's happened. Okay. Well, you're going to stay terra firma. You're not going to go real estate on Mars or anything like that. <laughs> no, I've, uh, you know, and that's the funny thing is as I've gotten older, I used to have these grand visions of changing the world and being a leader and doing things. But honestly, there's an expression where the uh, pioneers get slaughtered and the settlers prosper. And in real estate, honestly, I don't need to be the first into a certain market, but if I do it and become a real market expert, and you don't need to have one investment in, in Michigan, the next one in Ohio, the next one in Buffalo, because you found some cheap deal there, you can invest in one or two markets and just become a real market expert there. You're the smartest person in the room, you sit down on a property and you can build millions of dollars in your net worth as a result of that. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. And I actually personally always say that it's not so much the material things, even though they have a certain importance as covering fundamentals of life or fundamental needs, but seeing like what you call the impact on people and how they can blossom and flourish and make something out of themselves. I always, when, when I hear something like that, remember one of my early coaching clients who literally, when I asked you know, how do you see your career? You know, when do you think you'll be ready for managing and becoming a manager and maybe a leader? And the response was, I don't see myself ever being able to manage. I can barely keep my proverbial stuff together. And now she is a beautiful woman, self-confident, is managing people, is doing all kinds of stuff. And I'm not saying this is all just because I had the pleasure to coach her, but to see that evolution when People get a little bit of guidance, a little bit of input, a little bit of maybe encouragement. I find that is just so amazing. And that's something I wouldn't even be able to say you can put a number on it. It's not a material thing. It's not a monetary thing. 
it's a human thing and and maybe this is a good point to stop and let me ask michael the human what are you going to do next on your journey well actually i'm working on it as we speak it's not a huge thing but my book for those that have are looking at the video here it's armchair real estate millionaire and as part of my vision of trying to help as many people as i can i'm working on an audiobook version and that hopefully will be released in march or april and so it'll hopefully be available on audible and all those sources and that's been a really neat experience because i'm not i can speak in public but it's a big difference in quality in terms of actually reading the words and so i've hired an incredible voice actor to do a lot of the work and i've been sort of directing that it's been really a neat experience from that perspective so i don't know if that's what you were talking about but that's my immediate thing that i've been putting a lot of time in right now and i'm really proud of the work that's coming out of it and i really hope that some of your listeners will go forth and download it because i'm proud of it yeah that's very cool and let's just say for a second somebody would want to be influenced by you are you accepting anybody to contact you and get some of that pulling up the bootstraps <laughs> well here's the offer i'll make to you axel is <laughs> if anybody goes ahead and buys the book and reads the book and does a review of my book you can set up a zoom call with me and or a meeting and we can have a one-on-one -on -one consultation where i could give you a little bit of guidance i'm not interested in doing ongoing coaching i think i would not do well with that because i take it too personally i get too invested in it so I don't think that fits my skill set very well, but certainly providing you some guidance and some tips and introducing you to great people like Axel and stuff like that and taking you to that next level. And congratulations for anyone who's listening because that's a huge step. In. You're not listening to the latest top 40 song, but you're actually trying to find ways of building your financial IQ. And that's where I try to help people as well. Yeah, that's awesome. And if so, what you're basically saying, if somebody on page 45, second paragraph finds something they don't quite get, then they can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, to a degree. And it'll be, yeah, I want to help people. I really do. If you're looking for ongoing coaching, I'm probably not the guy, but I'm, I'm, I'm here to help. Yeah, well, if they need ongoing support, they come to me. And then if I can't answer, then I know there is the wise guy, Michael. <laughs> to go to. all right cool well, it was Michael, great to meet you it was yeah, great absolutely i mean i really enjoyed our conversation i love it that you prepared the answers to our questions that we always have at the end so thank you so much and like we said people buy the book give a review that helps the book on amazon to actually let other people know why it was cool to read it thank you Thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Ideal Investor Show. More info and the links we mentioned during the show are in the show notes or you can go to our website at idealwealthgrower.com and sign up for the Apple Podcast link. And if you like to talk to me, sign up for a strategy call. Hopefully you want to share what you learned with your network and bring more people in. We are really eager to hear your comments. And until next time, be well, stay safe and ciao.